Hello future nurses, welcome back to this channel. In this video, we are going to learn on how to make pathophysiology, drug study, and discharge planning. First, let us learn about pathophysiology. Tips in making a pathophysiology A pathophysiology explains the process of biologic and physical manifestation or changes as they correlate to the underlying abnormalities and physiologic disturbances in the body. To review your anatomy and physiology, you need to know how the body acts in a normal way so you can identify the abnormalities. For example, the sodium attracts water into the blood vessels to help maintain fluid balance. So for the abnormalities, we have hyponatremia and hypernatremia. Hyponatremia occurs when sodium levels in the blood are too low. So extra water goes into the body cells, causing them to swell, resulting to fluid volume excess. And for hypernatremia, this occurs when water moves out of body tissues and into the blood so water can be lost from cells causing them to shrink resulting to fluid volume deficit what to include in pathophysiology we need to include the causative agent the signs and symptoms the treatment including medication diagnostic tests complications manifested or not manifested by patient, nursing diagnosis, and the legends. In making the pathophysiology, we have to first establish legends. This is assigning colors to each factor correlated. The predisposing and precipitating factors can be yellow, diagnostic test as green, the signs and symptoms as orange, complications as blue, Nursing diagnosis as pink or the treatment including the medications can be purple. Then, we have to start the diagram with the etiology. These are the predisposing and precipitating factors. Predisposing factors are something inherent or puts you at risk that may lead to a problem. This can be age, race, gender, or history. The precipitating factors are triggers or provokes the problem. This can be the allergies, standing disease, stress, or electrolyte imbalance. Next is to be specific by narrowing it down to the cellular level. For example, age causes defects in the smooth muscle growth and structure, leading to vascular thickness, resulting to increased peripheral resistance hence increasing the blood pressure and increased heart rate. Electrolyte imbalance or the high sodium attracts water into the blood vessels leading to high blood volume resulting to high blood pressure as well as increased heart rate. Next is to connect the dots. We have to associate the diagnostic procedures and symptoms to each abnormality or changes. Increased heart rate or the increased blood pressure may lead for the client to experience fatigue, headache, heart palpitations, shortness of breath, as well as vision problems. High sodium is also manifested in the blood test containing high blood serum sodium. Next is to provide complication. For example, High sodium attracts water into the blood vessels. This results to fluid retention and then lead to fluid buildup between the pleural spaces of the lungs or as we call it, the pleural effusion. Next is to establish a nursing diagnosis. For example, activity intolerance related to increased heart metabolism secondary to hypertension as evidenced by verbalization of fatigue and dizziness. At the end of the diagram, we have to provide treatment as well as the management and this may include the medications. An example is encouraging active range of motion exercises or encouraging the patient to participate in planning activities that gradually build endurance. 
instruct patients to plan activities for time when they have the most energy. Advise patients to decrease sodium intake. Teach energy conservation techniques such as sitting to do tasks, frequent position changes, pushing rather than pulling, sliding rather than lifting, or placing frequently used items within reach. Administered antihypertensive medications as prescribed such as clonidine or catapress at 75 micrograms per RM and luzartan or cozar 50 milligrams per RM. Here is an example of pathophysiology, a pathophysiology for pleural effusion. Below this, there is a legend, and this legend helps us fully understand what these colors are representing. So for the signs and symptoms, it is colored orange box. For the treatment, it is violet. For the diagnostic test, it is colored green. For the complications, it is colored blue. For the nursing diagnosis, it is colored pink. For the predisposing and precipitating, it is represented by colored yellow. And lastly, the disease process is represented by colored white box. Now, what happens with pleural effusion? Predisposing factors include leak from the organs, cancer, and infections. Precipitating factors include smoking and alcohol intake. Pleural effusion occurs because a fluid-filled nodules and cysts from the breast and liver leaks around the cells of the capillaries of the pleura caused by an inflammation or exudate. To rule out presence of inflammation, several diagnostic procedures are made. First is needle biopsy, which will show fibrocystic changes with focal hyperplasia, which is present in our patient who has a right breast mass. Second, abdominal CT scan is made, which will show hepatomegaly with enhancing hypodense nodule, as well as minimal ascites at the right pericolic gutter and pelvic cavity. With inflammation, there will be a buildup of excess fluid between the layers of the pleura outside the lungs, which will prevent the lung from expanding effectively. And with an effective lung expansion, it will cause intrathoracic pressure and the signs and symptoms arise. And the signs and symptoms include shortness of breath, chest pain, pleuritic chest pain, fever, and cough. With all this, Nursing diagnosis is made, which is an effective breathing leading to decrease in oxygenation and tissue perfusion. Followed by the treatment, which is the video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery to drain the excess fluid out of the pleura, as well as several drugs like steroids, anti-inflammatory drugs, antibiotics, all these are per medical doctor's order. Now moving on, let's learn how to make a drug study. Drug study Nurses play an integral role in administering medication to patients and depending on the environment in which they work. It could be doing so as often as every few minutes, especially in hospital setting. As a result, it's imperative that nurses have a solid understanding of pharmacology. And that is the purpose of our drug study. Now, let's talk about the parts of the drug study. The drug study sheet contains five columns. The name of the drug, mechanism of action, indications and contraindications, side effects and adverse effects, and lastly, the nursing responsibilities. The name of the drug includes the generic name, brand name, classification, dosage, route, frequency, and timing. Each medicine has an approved name called generic name. The brand name refers to the name given by the producing company. Drug classification are a way to organize drugs into categories. Dosage refers to a specified amount of medication taken at one time. The routes of administration is the path by which a drug, fluid, poison, or other substance is taken into the body. It can be per RM, IVTT, subcutaneous, rectal route, ocular route, vaginal route, sublingual, 
or nasal route. Frequency is called dosage regimen. Frequencies can be OD, BID, TID, QID, Q8 hours, Q4 hours. Next is the timing. Taking medicine on time as prescribed is essential to making sure your body has an effect amount of the drug at all times. Mechanism of action refers to the specific biochemical interaction through which a drug substance produces its pharmacological effect. Indication is the use of that drug for treating a particular disease. Contraindication is the specific situation in which a drug, procedure, or surgery should not be used because it may be harmful to the person. Side effects are unwanted, undesirable effects that are possibly related to a drug. Adverse effects can be an appreciably harmful or unpleasant reaction. Nursing responsibilities includes ensuring that the right medication is properly drawn up in the correct dose and administered at the right time through the right route to the right patient. Let's have salbutamol as an example. So salbutamol is a generic name. Its brand names include Proventel, Vespera ER, Acuneb, Ventodisc, and Ventolin. It belongs to a family of bronchodilator and adrenergics. Dosage is one nebule, routes is inhalation, frequency Q6 hours, timing could be 1 a.m., 7 a.m., and 1 p.m. The mechanism of action of this drug is that it stimulates beta-2 adrenergic receptors in lungs, resulting in relaxation of bronchial smooth muscles. This drug is indicated for quick relief of bronchospasm induced through both exercise and physiological alterations. Also, to control and prevent reversible airway obstruction caused by bronchial asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases such as emphysema and chronic bronchitis, as well as other obstructive pulmonary diseases. Salbutamol is contraindicated to hypersensitivity to salbutamol, tachyarrhythmias and tachycardia caused by digitalis intoxication, cardiac disease including coronary insufficiency, a history of stroke, coronary artery disease, and cardiac arrhythmias, also hypertension and hyperthyroidism. Side effects for the CNS restlessness EENT dry and irritated nose and throat, metabolic hypokalemia, musculoskeletal muscle cramps, respiratory coughing. For the adverse effects, excessive sympathomimetic stimulation may produce palpitations, ectopy, tachycardia, chest pain, slight increase in BP, followed by substantial decrease, chills, diaphoresis, blanching of skin. For the nursing responsibilities before, assess lung sounds, pulse, blood pressure, color, characteristics of sputum noted. Assess lung sounds for wheezing, bronchoconstriction, rails. Instruct the patient to follow guidelines for proper use of inhaler. After, monitor rate, depth, rhythm, type of respiration, quality and rate of pulse, EKJ, serum potassium glucose, ABG determinations. Increase fluid intake, decreases lung secretion viscosity. Do not take more than two inhalations at any one time. Offer emotional support, high incidence of anxiety due to difficulty in breathing, and sympathomimetic response to drug. Rinsing mouth with water immediately after inhalation may prevent mouth or throat dryness. Avoid excessive use of caffeine derivatives such as chocolate, coffee, tea, cola, and cocoa. Now let us learn about discharge planning. A discharge plan should be started upon the patient's admission. The principle is to anticipate potential measures for the continuity of the patient's care. 
The nurse is responsible for ensuring that the patient is to be discharged. In doing a discharge plan, we must first gather data. The nurse must conduct an assessment of the patient's physical condition and overall status. It includes asking the patient about how she feels and getting the patient's vital signs. After gathering your data, go to the station and check the patient's chart. Be sure that it is the right patient. Check the written order of the physician regarding the patient's home medication and treatment. Then, start making a discharge plan about it. In making a discharge plan, you must follow methods. This guides you in making a good discharge plan. A successfully planned and executed hospital discharge is critically important to a patient's continued recovery and fulfillment of post-discharge care. M stands for medication. Double check the doctor's written order about the patient's home medication before writing it on your plan. Ascertain that you include the right medication, right dose, right route, right frequency, and right timing. Make sure that the purpose of the medication is stated, as well as the potential side effects and associated warnings concerning the medications. E stands for exercise. Include the patient's prescribed range of motion exercises. Be specific in providing what type of exercise is included in the patient's management, whether it is a passive or active range of motion exercises. P stands for treatment. This includes pending lab works or tests that need to be checked, as well as rehabilitative programs and therapies if there are any. H stands for health teaching. Patients must have a clear understanding of their medical conditions and what must be done to continue care as an outpatient. Educate a patient on the importance of strict adherence to the treatment. Encourage the SO's participation in the management of the patient's condition. Instruct the patient, together with the SO, to contact the physician if a problem occurs. O stands for outpatient referral. The patient must have a contact number of his attending physician and should be provided with a 24-hour phone number for emergencies. The patient must be provided with the exact dates and times of follow-up appointments. D stands for diet. This includes the appropriate diet intended for the patient's condition, such as a low-sodium, low-fat diet. The patient must be informed of the importance of increasing oral fluid intake and the consumption of nutritious food. S stands for spiritual. The patient must be encouraged to strengthen his or her relationship with the Lord and attend Masses. After finalizing the discharge plan, the nurse must head to the patient's room and inform the patient of the necessary instructions. The importance of communicating clear discharge instructions to patients cannot be understated. The discharge conversation initiated by both the attending clinician and discharging nurse must contain all pertinent information necessary to ensure a safe departure from the hospital and successful follow-up. It is also important to have a family member, friend, caretaker, or home health aide engage in the conversation. Any discharge instructions reviewed with the patient must also be put in a written form for the patient to take home. It needs to be specific, written in terms the patient can understand, thorough, and legible.